Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 36, my name's Andy, and we're gonna take this one quite slowly. We're gonna try and think through what async and await really mean when you write them in your code, um, so that you can stop. If you've tried writing any async await code, you might have kind of written it and hoped. That's certainly what I did for quite a while, um, and not really understood what, what the code means, but it, because you can write code that kind of looks like non-async code, um, you can kind of guess and just muddle through. What we're going to try and do in this video is understand what they actually do so that you can reason when you get a weird error message um, from the compiler or something doesn't work the way uh, you expected it to. You might just pick up some tools uh, in this video um, to, to help you figure out what's really going on. I'm going to do my best to explain you might need to watch it again. You might need to watch someone else's video to help you, but um, uh, hopefully we'll make some progress today. So um, what we're going to start by doing is expanding uh, async by which I mean we're going to take some code that's got async and await in it, and we're going to look at what it really does or what the compiler kind of turns it into um, under the hood. So let me just remind you what the web scraper example was. So this was just an example of what async code can look like that we looked at a couple of videos ago. Um, so you can see there is a function here which says async before the fun to say this is an async function. And async functions are kind of fundamentally different from normal functions. And inside an async function, what you're allowed to do is use the await keyword to wait for some kind of asynchronous thing. Actually, what we're doing is awaiting a future and we'll understand that a little bit more. We talked about futures in the last video. Um, so jump back to that if you need to know a little bit more about kind of what a future is, but we'll, uh, maybe it'll make more sense after this video. So you can use this await um, postfix again here for another future to uh, wait for it. And so basically what you're doing here is writing code that looks like it just goes through step one, step two, step three. Um, but what's happening underneath is when we get to this await point, um, we're, we're potentially our program stopping for ages, going off and doing a whole load of other stuff, and then coming back. And when it comes back, everything that you had in scope and, and you were using at this point is kind of just automatically back in scope for you and ready. Um, and today's video is going to be about um, what that actually looks like, what really happens when that kind of trans transformation of your code from something that looks easy to read like this happens and turns it into something that deals with futures, which is the stuff we were talking about in the last video, which have this poll method. So, um, futures are cool, but why didn't I see them in the web scope example, which is that's the example we just looked back at. Um, so let's go back to basics and just try and look at what is what happens to your code, or how does the compiler transform your code if you write async fun instead of just fun? Well, what the compiler does under the hood is effectively um, just translate it into um, a, like normal code that doesn't have the async and await keywords in it. So here's a kind of intermediate step in that transformation. So the async from the function uh, definition is gone. This is just a function. But the return type is different. Instead of returning uh, u8, this is like an async function returns u8. Instead of that, that gets translated into just a normal function, but returns a future uh, whose output type is u8. So this impl future means um, we're not saying exactly what type it returns. We're saying it returns something that implements um, a fu the future trait with an output type of u8. So um, we're not explicitly saying the exact return type. In fact, we kind of can't say that. But what we can say is it's something implementing this trait. So this is a generic function, uh, but it's generic over something that's kind of implicit because this impl is like an implicit thing there's no like t that is the like the type um and the type that's being returned is um the like the value of this async block so basically an async function gets translated into a normal function returning a future wrapped around the the type you're returning and an async block as the body of the function now the body of this particular function is completely trivial right it's just always 5 just returns 5 um so the body of this function uh, which is what it gets translated into, is an async block that like always returns 5. So this this function is not doing anything very interesting or even asynchronous, right? 
um, but it's just um, as an example. So once we've got that intermediate translation step, you notice there's still an async keyword here, so we're not quite done. Um, we then translate one more time. I mean, in our head, like surely the compiler doesn't really do it in these two steps, but anyway. Um, so the signature remains the same. It's still a, a function returning uh, something that implements future. But then the async block gets translated into um, some uh, async code. In this case, uh, like it's because it's completely trivial, it just creates a future um, that always returns five. This this thing, this stuff here is just the code for create me a future that is already ready, as in whenever you call poll on it, it immediately gives you back the answer. Uh, and the answer it gives you back is always five. So this is just trivial stuff, but basically saying um, it translates the signature, wraps everything in an async block, and then it turns that async block into async code. In this case, that's kind of trivial. It's just a future that's always ready. Um, so an async block always gives you the kind of the value that this resolves to or kind of returns is always going to be a future of some kind. Normally, it's going to be a more complicated future than this. In this simple example, it's just a future that's always ready with the value 5. Okay, so let's th think about a more complicated example. So that was just a very simple example. So now we'll strip away the function definition stuff because um, we know that the function definition is kind of trivially just translated into um, a function that returns a future and has an async block in it. And let's just look at an async block. Um, and an async block, it's like it's like other code blocks, right? It, so these curly brackets work the same way they do in other code, as in things get dropped at the end of that, that block and stuff like that. But it's different because it has this async keyword, which means it, it resolves to a future of some kind. And also sometimes they have a move, which works the same as you've seen it in closures. It basically means stuff that was owned by this outer scope here that gets used in here is going to be moved inside. So these two features that are getting moved, getting used, they get kind of moved inside the block. So now they're owned by the block and they'll get dropped at the end of the block and you wouldn't be able to use them afterwards. So the move keyword just works the way you might expect. So don't get put off by that. Let's think about the kind of main thing that's going on here, which is that somehow we've got hold of two futures. Now that could be by explicitly constructing them like we saw on the previous slide, or it could be by doing some async stuff or something like that, calling an async function. Anyway, somehow we've got some futures and then we've got this async block where we await those features. So um, you can't await things outside of an async block unless you're in an async function because it has that implicit async block. But you can await things inside an async block. The only thing you can await is something that implements future, right? So in, in a way, it's quite straightforward. Async blocks always give you a future and you can't await things that are not themselves features. You can only await futures. Um, and that's because it's actually just syntactic sugar for this kind of expansion that I'm going to show you. So let's think about what the meaning of this code is. The meaning of this code is given these two futures that already exist, wait for the first one. When you finish waiting for the first one, wait for the second one. And when you've finished um, the second one, then like you're done. Notice that there's semicolons here. So this block kind of doesn't return it will return sort of an empty feature, you know, empty with an output of, of the unit type, you know, nothing coming back from it. If we didn't have the semicolon here, we'd expect this async block to give us back the answer from awaiting feature two or something like that. Um, so, okay, so we need to translate that code into code that doesn't have async and await keywords in it. Uh, and the, the actual code is on the next slide, but here's like the data that gets kind of created behind the scenes. Now, by the way, this, the actual code, like the, what the compiler actually does is not exactly this. This is like a simplified version, but this is like good enough for you to think about how it works. So what happens is when the compiler sees code like this, where we're saying, I want you to wait for one thing, then I want you to wait for another thing. Um, it, it, it knows that it needs to hold on to some data. But the point is when you hit this await point, it might go off and do completely different stuff, and then come back later. And you need to still have um, like future two around so that you can await it after future one is finished or whatever. And it needs to have future one still around because it needs to poll it. And we'll see that in a minute. So basically, it needs to make a struct. And this is like this, like maybe a better name for this struct would be like my async thing or whatever, you know, like my data that I'm holding on to. 
Um, so the compiler like implicitly creates this struct or like some way of holding on to the data, which holds on to um, the two things that 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 we that this block is own or like needs to have to have the context. In this case, the two futures that it needs to own, which are of type foot one and foot two, and also something that remembers kind of what our current state was um, at the time when we got paused. So the point the, re the point of this struct is it holds on to all the information we need to be able to pick up later when we come back from an await and carry on with what we were doing. And then this the state, like what state are we currently in, um, is stored in this type that, that we could call say, you know, my my things I need to remember state. And um, the the options are we're either waiting for future one because we've hit this this point or we're waiting for future two because we've hit this point, or we've completely finished. Um, in which case, like if someone polls us, um, then we'll just give them back the answer. So, like I said, this is not exactly what the compiler produces, but it's good enough for you to think. Whenever I'm, I have an async block like this, or whenever I'm doing any awaiting, then the compiler needs to like hold on to all the information about what state we're in, so that it can carry on later when. Um, it finds out that future one has finally stopped doing something. And future one might be something like waiting for a network request to finish or something like that. So it's kind of an unpredictable amount of time in the future that it will be ready. The compiler is doing, a, uh, well, the archive is doing loads of other work because the async runtime is kind of doling out tasks to different threads and saying, please do some work for me. Uh, and meanwhile, it's holding on to our state so that when it, when we finally finish with future one, it'll come back here and say, kind of rehydrate everything and say, Okay, future one's finished, so my, you know, uh, my state here has changed to be, say, awaiting future two or something like that. Well, the state, I guess it will execute some code and then get into that state. So this, this, this thing remembers the state at a moment when we're actually waiting, not this, not the intermediate state, because that'll just be normal, the code is executing type stuff. All right, I'm waffling too much. So, key point is the async block here gets translated into information about um, what I was up to at the moment when I got paused um, because I was waiting for something. So this code is going to get translated from code that looks like it just goes step by step, listen to future one, or wait for future one, wait for future two, and then finish. What's actually happening is we're making a future that can get polled. Remember we talked about futures in the last video and how they get polled? So the runtime... We don't call poll, but the runtime um, uh, system like p calls poll for us to check whether um, we've finished waiting for this thing and it's ready or not. So here is the code for our poll function, because like I said, the, the runtime is going to call poll. Um, and we already have future one and future two, which have poll methods. Uh, and we have those structs that we've just, that struct in that enum that we just created to say, what is our current state? So when someone polls us, um, we, we, we're in this struct. So we're in, we're in our kind of my stuff I need to remember, um, struct. We're implementing the future trait for it. So the compiler generates all this code for this poll method by looking at our original code. So this original code here gets translated into this poll method by implementing future on our, on our, like, I've, I'm remembering a load of stuff struct. The poll future takes in the self. So actually, the self is the, 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 my remember, my stuff I have to remember struct. So it's self has this future one, future two and state inside it. And it also has this context that we won't think about because it's pretty scary and confusing. And what poll does is basically, um, looks at our current state and it says if we're awaiting future one then call poll on future one and if we're awaiting future two call poll on future two and if we're done give back the answer and in this case the answer is just uh, the unit type because as i said there's a semicolon after the, that await statement so the the final answer from this async block in this case will be just um a future that is um, or rather like a, yeah, a this, when poll returns poll ready, that's like a future that is ready. Um, and it return, and it's, in this case, it's returning unit type, but it could be returning like the answer from processing our async block. I mean, it is returning the answer from processing our async block. It's just that the answer is, uh, the unit type in this case. 
So we've got these two possible cases, three, three possible cases, but the other, the first two are we're waiting for future one. So we call future one dot poll, um, with some stuff. And then there's two possibilities of what poll might give us back. Either it is ready, in which case we change state. Like it might give us back an answer, by the way, which is why this can get more complicated. In this case, it gave us back like a unit because there's nothing to come back. But we, once we finished waiting for future one, because polling future one gave us back ready, then our state becomes waiting for future two. Um, if it gives us back pending, meaning like we haven't yet finished, future one hasn't yet finished, then we are obviously still pending. And then exactly the same thing happens uh, if we're waiting for future two. If it gives us back ready, then we change state again to be the done state. Um, otherwise, um, if we're waiting for future two, well, then obviously we're still waiting for this whole async block. Um, so yeah, so that is like, again, this is not actually exactly what the compiler does. It's really simplified. But it does something like this. It takes an async block which looks like ordinary code and turns it into the implementation of a poll method, which, um, and by the way, this is all in a loop. So if we, if we say state becomes state done, we'll then loop around again, state done and return ready, right? So it's like, that just like, um, means that we don't have to do any complicated, um, do like awaiting future one and then like make sure you check a future two again kind of thing. It does by looping. We just um, simplify that away for ourselves. Anyway, that's slightly relevant. So the point is um, that very simple looking async block turns into a uh, poll implementation of a poll method, which is then very from the compiler's point of view is then very simple because there's no async and await code in this um, in this on the screen. So the async runtime can just repeatedly call poll and it will get back either ready or pending. And it knows what to do with each of those answers so it can execute. So essentially, our async block is translated into like the runtime calling poll over and over plus this code. Uh, and this code is enough to give us the logic that we specified in that very simple async block to say, wait for the first one, then wait for the second one, and then you're done. And it looks kind of like the and then future thing that we were looking at in, a, in the previous video. Okay, so that was my attempt at explaining to you how your nice simple async await code that feels like it's just straightforward, not even async code to you, gets translated into the complicated stuff we were talking about in the last couple of videos, where actually there's no such thing as async and await, there's only poll, right? So like what from the compiler's point of view, um, it can't await stuff, like it has to know what to do next. So what it does is calls poll, and then it responds to poll either by like polling again later because you weren't ready, or by giving back the answer because you were ready. Um, and the the way it, it gets rid of the async and await keywords, which it in some sense doesn't understand, is by translating that async and await code into a poll method that looks a bit like the thing we were just looking at. All right, so here are our takeaways. It, um, we generate a state machine. So a state machine, like that poll method is exactly a state machine, right? It's like, if you're in this state, do this. If you're in this state, do this. And that state machine um, implements a future. So an async block, all an async block ever gives you is a future that you can await. And all awaiting does is like, like or you can only ever await a future. And all awaiting does is say, um, if this feature is ready, carry on with the next bit of code. If the feature is not ready, keep polling me until I am ready. Um, and there's a complicated stuff there about like, when does it poll again? It has to, um, there's this kind of con concept of waking up in order to poll again, which we've not covered in this video because we've covered enough already. Um, but you can think of it as it keeps on calling poll, 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 poll. Actually, what happens is, uh, it kind of knows when it needs to wake up and, and call poll, and that's out of the scope of this video. So yeah, you can await futures. Every time you await, um, we introduce a new state, as in a new, in our state machine, which is saying, if I'm if I'm here, then do this. If I'm here, then do this. Um, when there's an await point, it says, like, one of the possible states I might be in is waiting for that await point, right? So each, each await point introduces a new state. Um, and as you might agree, Trying to read that code on the previous slide, the, the implementation of poll is quite difficult and hard to understand. And that's how people used to, what, to do async code in Rust, by the way, before all this. Um, but that first bit of code we saw with just two lines that said this dot await and then this dot await was relatively simple. And 
when your brain is at a level of abstraction where it doesn't have to think about whole methods, which is most of the time, by the way, um, then it's simple and easy for us to follow that and just trust that underneath the runtime is doing this translation and stuff like that. So hopefully that helped. If uh, I said anything confusing there, um, feel free to leave comments. I'll try and uh, explain a bit more or even do another video if it, uh, it didn't come across. Um, but hopefully that takes some of the magic out of async and await. Um, and um, shows you that it's just code. And once you've got the idea that like an async block is just like a block, but it gets translated into a future, uh, and especially like the idea of like moving ownership in, then you'll understand some of the weird error messages you get. And in particular, things about ownership that get confusing, like everything that happens inside that async block needs to get stored in that state, in that struct that we created of like my stuff I have to remember. So that means sometimes it has to live longer than you expect because uh, it look it might look to you like your function um, like just does some stuff and then returns the answer. But actually what's happening is that function could return multiple times in the middle because it's getting translated into a poll function that returns. Um, and that means that the ownership of any of the things that it, it um, uses is going to get it's going to get owned by that struct we created. The my stuff to remember struct it was called async future in the example, and um, sometimes that ownership goes on. Like sometimes the thing you're using doesn't have you don't have permission to own it for that long. Like it's a reference that might go away, and that can be the source of some of the most confusing error messages when you're writing async code. Essentially, if you're going to return a future that is hanging on to um, this stuff you basically need to take ownership of that thing because you don't know how long that future is going to last. Also, that future might get passed around between threads because your async runtime um, might be doing things with multiple threads. So if you get error messages saying, um, like, this thing doesn't live long enough or this thing is not sent because it can't be sent into another thread, that's why. Because under the hood, uh, the compiler is making this, like, my stuff I have to remember struct on your behalf and owning that thing for longer than it kind of looks like in the async code. Um, so the, uh, the answer to that is to like take a copy of it or in some way have something that you own or like an arc or something that means that, um, there's like shared ownership of it so that this future that gets returned, this is my stuff to remember struct, um, that implements future that, uh, so that that can actually own it and keep hold of it and it get, and be passed around between threads. Hope that helps. Uh, like I said, um, comments welcome. Um, or if you'd like me to go in uh, deeper on any of these pits, let me know. Uh, hope you enjoyed. See you next time.